Um, no, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, and partly because I think PGTA seems really simple on the surface, like you do a biopsy, you send it off, you get an answer. Um, but the more you get into it and the more you try to run a PGTA program, especially if it's a large program, I think the more complicated it can be. And so while PGTA goes well much of the time, most of the time, um, that would be a boring talk. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about some of the clinical and counseling challenges that we have. So the perspective that I bring to this is one of having helped to run a large PGT program within a, a complex IVF center um, for the last 10 years until recently. And I think the best way to think about framing a PGT program that is successful and dynamic is to put it really at the center of all of the different departments that are involved in helping to run, run this program. That includes, of course, the embryologists, the storage programs, the, the clinical team, the physicians, the nurse practitioners, the nurses, the coordinators, the finance and business office, the practice management and the legal team, and the genetic counseling team. So really it's all of these teams working in synergy that make a program, I think, a well-oiled machine. Oops. And just to give an example of sort of one of these relationships within that graph, um, if we just look at, for example, the embryology team interacting with the genetic counseling team, there's so many ways in which we work together to make this a smooth process. So um, in the clinic, these teams can work together to help choose a lab, to look at the different technologies that are available, how easy is it for that test to be used by the embryology team, what does the shipping look like, what is the customer support, how together do we rank these embryos for transfer using both their embryology quality as well as the PGT results? How do we clear embryos for transfer when we're transferring non-euploid embryos, mosaics, PGTM embryos? How are we working together to make those decisions with the patient and the clinical team? What are we doing to troubleshoot issues when these rates of inconclusive results, for example, are popping up and we're trying to figure out what's going on there? And then how do we develop and manage embryo storage and disposition protocols? And I'll talk more about that in a second. So the first genetic counseling challenge that I'll talk about is the variation that we see between PGT labs that makes it very difficult to know how to evaluate labs. Most people who are trying to decide which PGT lab to look for and to evaluate which one is best don't have a background in genetics or in genetic test information or validation. And so this can be very tricky. One of the main factors that we want to look at, though, is how is the test validated? Tests can be validated in a lot of different ways. The most common ways that we see in PGTA for tests to be validated is through testing of cell lines, rebiopsy studies, and the gold standard, which would be non-selection clinical studies. But there's a variety of ways labs have gone about this and trying to figure that out and how labs have arrived at their answer for their assay is very difficult. We also, of course, know people are using different technologies, next generation sequencing, SNPs, and others. And the classification is really different, too. Labs could get, two different labs could get the exact same result, and one lab could call that a mosaic result, and one lab could call that an aneuploid result. So trying to understand why a lab classifies an embryo in a certain way is also very challenging. All of those factors then come together to influence the clinical significance of that result. So the positive predictive value, meaning if you find an aneuploid answer, for example, what is the chance that embryo is actually aneuploid? And the negative predictive value, if you get a normal result, what is the chance that embryo actually has a normal karyotype? Those are really the things that come out of the validation and classification process that need to be well understood. And that in turn is going to influence the limitations, right? So if you have a lab that has a low resolution platform versus high resolution, that might influence, for example, how many segmental aneuploidies you find and understanding kind of where those cutoffs are and why. That also then comes in turn into the error rate. So how many embryos that are called aneuploid actually did have reproductive potential? How many that are called euploid did not? So evaluating this and kind of putting it all together is a big part of the process of choosing a lab, but also downstream kind of what the challenges are that we experience in looking at these results. So let's just look as an, as an example here at mosaicism. So I've listed five different labs here. These are real labs um, that all have a slightly different um, platform that they're using. Sometimes actually similar, very similar platforms, but they might be using different cutoffs for what they call abnormal or what they call high or low level mosaicism. 
So looking at these and trying to understand why would a lab put a cutoff in a certain place? How does that influence the rate of normal, mosaic, or abnormal results? And then looking to see, you know, is it high or is it low? Does that have clinical significance associated with it? We see different cutoffs being used. And we see certain labs that are masking mosaic results and using a more simplified cutoff in the middle, like 40 or 50 percent. This can cause a couple of issues. One is that clinicians and patients may not recognize that a lab actually does have reproductive potential if it's a high-level mosaic that was masked as aneuploid. It also can cause issues because uh, through the Cures Act, patients actually do have access to the raw data from the lab and can request that at any time and could come to understand that their embryo was mosaic when in fact it was labeled as aneuploid. So any ordering clinician should have a really good sense of what these issues are. The other issue is that as we look at different labs, I mean IVF clinics, it's common now for clinics to use many different labs. So trying to keep track internally of which lab is doing what and where they set their cutoff and how they're classifying these results in different ways can be really challenging. Changing results. So over time, it's very, very common for laboratories to change their platform slightly, to change their classification of results, and then in turn, embryos that were once in one category could be in a different category. I think this is an extremely difficult area to manage in the clinic, in particular in the embryology lab. So let's just look at some examples. These are just over the past year, different ways in which labs have changed classifications. So for example, if a lab had a raw data result where they got a mosaic trisomy 13, 18, 21, X or Y, there are labs that at one point called that aneuploid, but then changed it, and now today those are labeled as mosaic. So if you're a clinician in front of a patient and you know that they have an embryo in storage that was called aneuploid trisomy 13, is it your responsibility to now go back and try to understand whether that embryo could have actually been mosaic? That's a very difficult thing to manage and I think most places just decide not to manage it um, and certainly that would be something you could stand behind because the report is from a certain point in time. But I do know of, of clinics where they do try to go back and, and get more information from the lab to try to understand if this embryo were tested today, would it be different and is this an embryo we could consider for transfer? Same thing with mosaic segmental aneuploid. There are labs that at one point called those full aneuploid, now call them mosaic. That are labs that called those mosaic initially, now call them euploid because they feel like they have similar reproductive potential to euploids. With uh, mosaic cutoffs, 30 to 50 percent, for clinics that used to opt out of mosaic, reporting might have been called aneuploid, and today they might be called euploid. And what's been a big topic at this meeting is chaotic embryos. So there are labs that put before when they got a profile where there was a complex aneuploidy, many different aneuploidies, or just data that was difficult to read, they might have labeled those as aneuploid, but come to find out now when those are rebiopsied, many of them, sometimes up to 30, 40% might actually be euploid. So those are now changing to be called chaotic. But there was a report just yesterday um, that came out in the literature of uh, an embryo that was transferred as a chaotic aneuploid that didn't make a healthy baby. So having to recognize these changes and really stay on top of them and understanding the limitations of any result. Another challenge is the need for evidence-based data. So what we're doing today with the genetic counseling, for example, on mosaic embryos, is we're doing our very best to counsel on the data that we have, but most of it is frankly not evidence-based. It's really coming from situations in which embryos have been transferred already with their results in hand, but not through blinded studies that have been done to properly evaluate the clinical significance of results. So for example, the true clinical significance of results is not definitively understood for mosaic embryos, for segmental aneuploid embryos, sometimes even for aneuploid embryos, and certainly for the no results or inconclusive or chaotic. So we do our best in genetic counseling and as clinicians and physicians, you do your best. But really at the end of the day, we, we do have an issue with having a lack of evidence to figure out how to support embryo selection decisions in terms of ranking embryos. So we get a lot of discussions about, okay, I have three mosaic embryos. Which one should I transfer first? Which one has the highest risk? Do we go off of the percentage? Do we go off how many chromosomes are involved? Does it matter if it's a monosomy or a trisomy? And we sort of make things up as we go along. You know, we want to think that we're making evidence-based decisions, but we do bring bias to those conversations. And we have to admit at the end of the day that we are sort of going off the cuff with some of these assumptions and recommendations.
The prenatal recommendations that follow from these transfers too, we don't really know what to say in terms of what prenatal diagnosis may or may not be indicated. We do our best, but we're kind of making some of this up as we go along. And I find that this really creates a balancing act for patients and our interactions with them in terms of over underestimating versus underestimating risk. We don't want to scare patients, but we do want to make them aware that there may be certain risks that we're not aware of. And so we find that we're constantly in this dance with the patient in terms of trying to strike the balance of not alarming them, but also not being so reassuring that we underestimate any of these risks. Communicating the limitations of PGT, I think, is increasingly difficult. The more tests we have available, the more it seems like we're able to give people a perfectly healthy baby. And so communicating what these limitations are is something that we just have to keep doing over and over again. We know that PGT does not guarantee that any embryo transfer is going to be successful or that a baby will be healthy. We know that it doesn't test for any other genetic issues and it's so common for patients to be confused between what carrier screening tells them versus PGT versus a really good family history, which in genetics we call the best genetic test. We have to go over prenatal recommendations and follow up because it's not perfect and even products of conception testing can be very important if there's a loss after a euploid embryo transfer. And again, providing hope that all of this is going to go perfectly well while also correcting any mis misconceptions that the patient brings to the table um, is, is always a challenge. For prenatal recommendations um, following embryo transfer, we know that we should still be recommending routine prenatal diagnosis and screening after PGTA. That's true after euploid embryo transfer, mosaic, segmental, aneuploid, everything. Patients should be counseled on the pros and cons of prenatal screening as compared to the accuracy of PGTA. There's a number of reasons that prenatal testing can add more information. There are differences in the tissue types that we're testing between embryos and pregnancies. The amount of DNA you have to work with is very different. The stage of embryo or fetal development is different. And the analytical limitations, the test that was used, and the biological limitations like mosaicism are all going to influence the difference in accuracy between those two tests. So we want to take into account the PGT result of the embryo that was transferred. Of course, if it was a normal result embryo, the risks for aneuploidy are going to be very low. And the patient wish or wishes and how much they can tolerate uncertainty. So after mosaic embryo transfer, we're seeing people make a lot of different decisions in terms of how much testing they want. Some people are very good at transferring that embryo and just letting go and saying, hey, if it was untested, I wouldn't even know about this result. And others just can't get rid of that nagging sense that there could be something wrong if they were told there was a mosaic finding. So I think it just needs to be very patient specific and the testing should be offered to everyone but never required. So I'll wrap up just by saying, if I was going to build a clinical PGTA program from scratch, this would be my wish list. This would be my perfect program. I think you need to have a very collaborative relationship between the genetics lab and the clinic. This seems obvious, but it's shocking to me how often this is not the case, where one feels like they're the client of the other and they don't feel like they can really ask good questions or give feedback, or when something goes wrong, there just really is not that collaboration there to work through problem solving. I think you need a really good feedback loop. The PGT lab should be sharing data back to the clinic in terms of their own aneuploidy rates, everything that they want to know about their own program and how they compare to other programs. And the clinic in turn should be sharing back with the PGT lab follow up on cases that were complicated or data on their um, success rates to help really have that be a symbiotic relationship. Pre-test and post-test counseling workflows. I can't emphasize this enough. How are you counseling your patients before the test? It doesn't need to be a full genetic counseling appointment, but there should be really good informed consent. There should be videos, handouts, multiple touch points in the process so people understand the purpose of PGT and what it can and can't do for you. And then post-test, how are you handling your mosaic embryo transfers? How are patients being counseled before they discard their embryos? Understanding those results and giving them the counseling that they need to make those informed decisions. Clear protocols and policies. So if your clinic has a policy against transferring mosaic embryos, that's okay, but patients should know that from the beginning. Maybe they don't want to do PGTA on all of their embryos. Maybe they want to think about that further. So they should know what's going to happen when they sign that consent form and what kinds of options they might be having taken away from them in that moment.
a healthy business model. I don't think anyone expects PGT to happen in a bubble without there being any you know, business model behind it. It should be a win-win, though, between the patient, the PGT lab, and the clinic. The patient should be getting a very good quality test for their money, and the lab and the clinic should also feel like they're running a sustainable program. Adequate advance notice on test platform changes. I just showed you the slide on how, how often labs change their cutoffs and the calls that they make. It's so much better if this is done in a way that the clinic has a heads up that that's going to happen and can be doing the adequate counseling in advance so patients know where those classifications are going to fall and how that's going to affect their consent and their embryo storage and disposition. Staff education, again, the first slide I showed you with everyone from the billing office to the front desk to the nurses to the embryologists answering questions about PGT, the more everyone is in the loop on how the clinic is handling the program, the better it will be for the patients. There's always going to be rare and incidental findings, like when there's a, su a suspected translocation based on PGTA results or an inherited deletion or something like that. So it's really nice to have that expert genetic support to know how to handle those results right away when that does occur. Of course, anyone doing PGTA needs to also have a good relationship with a lab that does PGTM and SR, if that's not already part of the, the relationship, and research opportunities so that both the clinic and the lab can continue to learn from their experience and report back on the data and experiences.